Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Tech of the Month, the series where we bring you, our tech thirsty viewers, the latest shiny, shiny goods to come through the Bike Radar office. This episode we have a true smorgasbord of fresh fancies. Kai has a very bright gilet, Oscar poses in some 3D printed titanium sunglasses and I've got perhaps the holy grail of trail rubber from Specialized. But first up, the road bike baron himself, Simon von Bromley, is working up a sweat on Wahoo's latest smart trainer. I hate to be the one to say it, but it looks as if summer is finally coming to an end. I know, I know. And it'll soon be time to think about riding indoors again. And with that in mind, Wahoo has just released an updated version of its high-end direct drive smart trainer with a rather curious new feature. That's right, I'm talking about the new Wahoo Kicker Move, a smart trainer which can slide back and forth by 8 inches to simulate how your bike moves when riding in the real world. Now, Wahoo says that this movement is inspired by third-party rocker plates and that not only does it make the experience of riding your bike indoors more realistic and engaging, but it's also more comfortable too. How does it work though, I hear you ask? Well, it's actually pretty simple. In a nutshell, the drive system and flywheel all sit within a slightly curved track and the whole thing can move back and forth in response to your pedaling and changing weight distribution. So far I've only got a couple of rides in on the kicker move, so you'll have to wait for my full review for a final decisive opinion on whether it's an overall improvement or not, but I am intrigued by my initial impressions. It certainly is different, and when you're just riding along normally in a game like Zwift, I do think it's a bit more comfortable than having your bike locked in place beneath you. What about everything else though? Well, beyond the movement stuff, it is basically the same trainer as the Wahoo Kicker V6 that was only released last year and is actually still available to buy. So it's got the same maximum power output, the same flywheel, the same electromagnetic drive system, the same power accuracy, the same connectivity features, including Wi-Fi. But that's no bad thing though, the Kicker V6 is a great smart trainer and if you missed my in-depth review of it, you can head to bikeradar.com and read it now. We've put a link in the video description below. Now in terms of weight and price, there are obviously some differences compared to the Kicker V6. Firstly, the Kicker Move is a chonky boy. At around 29 and a half kilos ready to ride, it really is a set it up and leave it in place kind of smart trainer. Now the two support legs do fold in, which is quite nice, but still, if you've got cyclist arms like me, then this isn't something you're going to want to be getting in and out of a cupboard every other day. Unless, of course, you're looking to add a little bit of resistance training to your plan. As for price, well, given the Kicker V6 was already pretty expensive, at a penny under £1,100 or $1,300 or euros, it's no surprise to see that the Wahoo Kicker Move isn't cheap either, costing another £300 or euros more. And that is pretty much all there is to it. What do you think though? Is integrating this kind of movement into a smart trainer a genius idea that every brand will eventually copy? Or is this just another gimmick to add to the huge pile of indoor training tech that doesn't make riding a stationary bike in your bedroom anything like riding one in the real world? As always, let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you are thinking about investing in a smart trainer this coming winter, then don't spend any money before reading all of our in-depth reviews on bikeradar.com or watching our 10-way mega test video on the best smart trainers currently available. Now though, let's go to Tom, who has a new set of specialized tires with a rather interesting name. Specialised mountain bike tyres haven't always had the best reputation among some in the cycling industry. However, since ditching their Gripton rubber for the simplified T-Series rubber and casing options in 2021, they've been on an upward trajectory in our opinion. This involves T5, T7 and T9 compounds in order of hardest to softest. The casings take shape as S-Works and control for their more XC tyres before moving up to grid, grid trail and grid gravity. Hopefully this makes it a little easier to dissect which rubber and casing combo will be best for you. The tyre I have here is the recently redesigned Purgatory. The Purgatory has been in the brand's lineup for over a decade. This latest version makes a big departure from the old tyre though. The tread pattern is completely different, moving from a largely paddle shaped design to a more open square blocked arrangement. This should make it better at clearing mud and more suited to front or rear use. The old Purgatory was definitely more of a rear only kind of tyre. 
The side knobs are also staggered rather than in line, which I'm hoping will give them a nice predictable feel in the bends. I'm not a fan of tyres with a large gap between centre and shoulder tread, so I'll see how I get on with these. Perhaps the most interesting thing though is the rubber and casing option Specialized has bestowed on its tasty new treads. Unlike a lot of other brands, you can get the Purgatory in their lighter weight casing and the grippiest rubber compound. They also offer the tougher casing with harder rubber too, and that's exactly the combo I have here. I plan to run the Grid T9 up front with the Grid Trail T7 out back. This should give me all the grip up front where I need it and a bit more protection and rolling speed at the rear. Interestingly though, the supposedly lighter Grid T9 tyre actually comes in heavier than the Grid Trail T7 at 1036 versus 1004 grams. Both are around 40 to 50 grams heavier than Specialized claims. I'll be mounting these up to my Norco Fluid Long Term to see how they fare, so stay tuned to BikeRadar.com for a full review in the future. Now I'll hand over to Oscar, who has quite frankly some of the most ridiculously expensive sunglasses I've ever seen. Yes, these POC sunglasses are not remotely cheap, but before I dive into the punchy price, let's cast an eye over the details. The Illicit Tie is a 3D printed titanium version of Pox frameless Illicit sunglasses. All that tech makes these the brand's lightest shades yet by a whole one gram. Yes, you heard that right, one whole gram. Weighing in at a feathery 22 grams, the Swedish manufactured non-folding glasses are constructed from recovered medical grade titanium. In plainer speak, that's waste generated in making surgical tools. The brand says it wanted to combine, and I quote, sustainable thinking with a strong focus on performance. Pock says the titanium starts as a large powder block and after the temples are solidified, the rest is blown away and reformulated into another block that can be used again. The open, lattice-like design of the temples is claimed to promote rigidity and reduce weight over what Pock calls the gorillamid plastic used on the standard illicits. Outside of the titanium trinkets, you won't find too many differences from the regular shades. They come with a violet silver mirror lens, as well as a spare clear option in the box. The large frameless lens is curved to enhance coverage, and two sizes of nose piece are provided to customise fit. They're also treated with Pox Repel Coating, which is claimed to protect them from dirt, water, sweat and other contaminants. To protect your investment, they have an anti-scratch treatment. So if you want to save one gram, just how much is it going to hurt your wallet? Well, the illicit ties are a rather decadent purchase at £350 or $400, which is £130 more than the standard illicits. Not only that, but if you want a set of these glasses, you'd better be quick because there's only 365 available. Well, from one fashion statement to another, I'm here to show you this vest. It's part of a collaboration between Finnish bike brand Pelago Bicycles, which was originally founded by two skateboarders, and the skate brand Element. The result of this strange combo is this colourful garment. It features this snazzy camo pattern, as they call it, which has been specifically designed for this brand mashup. There's substance to match the style too. It features zipped pockets with a fleece lining to keep your hands nice and toasty. On the back are three rear mesh pockets with plenty of space for stashing whatever you might need. It's made of waterproof materials which has so far proved effective, although due to the lack of sleeves it wouldn't be my first choice in a heavier rain. And it's all made from 100% recycled polyester. But that's not all this vest has hidden up its lack of sleeves. It's reversible. The cosy black fleece interior becomes a subdued exterior, giving a more casual look. This side features a spacious chest pocket and two hand pockets, although these don't zip. I found it to be a great all-rounder, whether it's for more casual use or for extra warmth and storage space on the bike. And after all, maybe a bit of skate style making its way into cycling might not be such a bad thing. It's available now on the Pelago website for 130 euros. Now it's time to hand over to Jack with a surprising twist to his usual riding habits. No, your eyes have not mistaken you. There is a lightweight shred sled here with me in our studio. 
I haven't turned my back on my beloved tandem or road bikes, but I have been loving this gorgeous Merida Big 910K. It's been a while since I turned to the dark side of mountain biking, but this 9,000 pound race rig has rekindled my love of the rough stuff. The Big 9 range has been overhauled for 2024 and unsurprisingly has been given the longer and slacker treatment. Merida says the bike's geometry is progressive and uses its agilometer sizing. In practice, while it's not as slack as some of its rivals, it has still got some pretty punchy numbers for a cross-country bike. The head angle is 68 degrees and the reach is fairly long at 472 millimeters long on this size large bike. Seat tube lengths are also pretty short on this bike. Now this bike uses a 30.9 millimeter diameter seat tube, which is also pretty short. Most modern cross country bikes use a 27.2 millimeter seat post, which while very flexible if you're using a carbon post, does limit your options for dropper posts. Here, with that short seat tube and the standard diameter, you can even slap on a long travel dropper post if you so wish. Now that does beg a pretty big question. If you were listening at the start of this segment, you will have noted this bike costs 9,000 pounds. 9,000 pounds for a hardtail, and it doesn't come with a dropper post. What do you think? Should every cross country bike like this come with a dropper? Or are you happy with some old school high posting? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thankfully, for the rest of the build, Merida has spared no expense. To start, the frame is Merida's lightest CF5 3 offering, helping to keep the weight down for this whole bike to well under 10 kilograms. Up front, we have the new RockShox SID SL Ultimate fork, though interestingly, it uses an old school two position lockout rather than the new three position lockout lever. For the drivetrain, we have SRAM's range topping XX SL transmission group set with a power meter. And then braking is taken care of with a pair of level ultimate stealth brakes with matching floating rotors. There's more carbon in the wheels with Reynolds' black label 309-289 XC hoops. Now these wheels are wrapped with a pair of surprisingly versatile Maxxis Recon race tires. I have been very surprised by these. They're very good tires in a wide range of conditions. The only thing I'm not so sold on is that super noisy free hub. That's a small quibble though. If you want to read my full review on this speedy steed, then slide over onto bikerader.com where there's a link in the description to the news story because I still need to write the full review. So concludes this episode of Tech of the Month. If you've stuck around, give yourself 10,000 bike radar points and let us know what you think of this month's delectable tech. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And if you want to see more juicy gadgetry, then check out this video.